So not only do I not use the modern technology, but more than that, the tone of this lecture will also be very classical, very different from what uh, is only the older lecture. I'm going to deal with some general concepts. And then try to see following very simple things. Where do we reach? So you have a Newton word. What what do we study uh, there? Newtonian mechanics. And that tells us, from the real that we have this the second law of motion. Now, let's ask some crazy questions. Uh, is there any limitation on the validity of this? Is it always valid? Pardon? Why? I think it doesn't need to do a different mode of thing. Something more crazy than the thing. Mass has, has to be no more important to say yes. So mass has to be no idea. Only then it makes sense. Right? So first question we say is that if you want to include a zero mass particle, then this equation is no good. More generally, that will tell you that the motion of zero mass particle cannot be accommodated in the Newtonian world, Newtonian mechanics. You need a new mechanics for it. That's one. Other thing, of course, you simply say that alpha is zero. Then, if n is non zero, then your x double dot is zero. <coughs> so, practically, what would you do that? Constant velocity, rather than what you say. Velocity vector is right. So let me ask one other previous and just say this. First thing you realize that if the particle under no force, its velocity is constant. And it is constant for all particles, irrespective of their mass, so long as mass is non zero. Right? So the constant velocity does not depend upon the mass of the particle. All particles, when the force is zero, move around the constant. So there is some universal character to this. That is, constant velocity is universal for all particles. It doesn't worry about the mass of the particle, whether it is heavier or lighter or any, any parameter of the particle. So this is 
the universal statement. And you know, what is the way we express universal statement? What is the thing which is universally valid? The universal statement are geometric. Because the geometry is the same for all. You have any geometry business. So then you have to say that this motion of a free particle. I should be right, should be able to express and the geometric step. And we all know what is the term which follows? <laughs> yes? The three particle moved along what term? Straight line. So when we say straight line, straight line, of course, you also have a two equivalent definitions. One, you say it is a shortest distance. But it is also a geometric definition. It is the curve whose tangent remains constant. Right? So this is a so the, the, the straight line means it refers to the geometry of the space. And here the geometry is we are talking about x, y, z. So this is the geometry of the three space. And three space, which is flat. No. <coughs> now, let's ask for another question. So here, we have a question here. The zero mass particle cannot be included in the Newtonian temple. Let's also ask another question. So here you had a constant velocity. But now if I say, suppose we want to have a universal constant velocity. The velocity which is constant relative to everything for all of the rest. Can we accommodate such a thing in the Newtonian framework? Or can we not? Right? So that simple question is that. <coughs> If we have a universal constant velocity, that means that velocity is constant relative to all frames, or all observers, then such a constant velocity, such universal velocity, can I accommodate in the Newtonian mechanics? Or other way to say that that such a velocity is it permitted within the Newtonian, Newtonian mechanism. And the answer, of course, you should get what is the law of addition of velocity in Newtonian mechanics? How should the velocity is add? What is it? Huh. So, so you say it is so it be something like this, right? 
if a particle is moving with the velocity u, and observer is one observer is moving with the b, then relative to the fellow observer at stationary, their velocity is applied. Now, this law, if this law has to be admitted, then this thing does not be admitted. This will contradict this. So the question is, the universal constant velocity cannot be accommodated. So we have another feeling the zero mass particle cannot be accommodated. Similarly, the universal constant velocity cannot be accommodated. In both things, now, before going anywhere, whenever you come across this kind of situation, you ought to develop a habit of arguing in that, this simple way at the level of a concept. Then, what should be the most uh, Elegant and satisfying thing. And that's that to get the solution. Could it be these two things are the same? That is the zero mass particle which we use in one of the most. Or other way to say, if I have a universal velocity, then that should be conceived. Is a particle with a zero mass. And here we are, so there is no further ever uh, qualification. By mass, I mean only from the rest mass. That is the only good definition of mass. Everything else, whatever those textbooks have said, you should forget it. <coughs> so, so we have one problem here in mechanics. The Newtonian law. So zero mass particle or universal velocity is not included. <clears throat> if you want to include this, we need a new mechanics. We have to go go beyond. So this. So the question here is, and here I could say. The, the mechanics is to describe the motion. It should describe the motion of everything which moves without any qualification. So if I have a zero mass particle, so first question, of course, we want to conceive of zero mass particle. Then what can we say about it? So first thing we have to say is, so first let's ask the question. Could this particle be at rest relative to any of the world? Does there exist a frame in which zero mass particle is at rest? Yes. Yeah. But there is nothing to do. Yes. Huh? Huh? It's own frame. But to associate a frame, I should be able to write on that, right? So, since First thing is, its rest mass is zero, which means in the frame in which it is at rest, it doesn't exist. There's no particle. Right? So, which means this, <clears throat> such a particle cannot be at rest. Related to who? Related to everybody. 
So such a particle should be always moving. That such a particle is a, has to move, and since it has to move relative to every observer, then what should be its velocity? So point one to six that this velocity should be called universally constant, should be same for all. Because if you say relative to one observer, it has a velocity v1. Then what you are going to say, this observer will say that no observer should be able to travel with velocity v1. Now, another observer says, relative to which its velocity is V2, then you are, that fellow is going to say, nobody is going to travel with velocity V2. If V1 and V2 are different, then you have a contradiction. Because one fellow says you can travel with that, another fellow says no. So, this velocity should be universal. So that is how the, the two things get in this related. The zero mass particle is having saying that has a universal constant velocity. So zero, so zero mass particle travels with the universal constant velocity. Since it is universal, I should be, as I could do here, that this motion is a straight line related to a flat sea geometry, I should be able to express this, its motion also as a geometric statement. And of course, since it's a constant velocity, you would like this thing to be straight line. But the question is, it cannot be a straight line in the free space. Because that is a, that is a thing for when I'm in non zero, which is non universal. If you want to own versions to so say, so, so the geometry here, so now you want the new geometry. To, to which we should be able to define a straight line, which should describe the motion of a, this universally constant velocity particle. So this is the situation of the Newtonian mechanics. Now let me ask the same question about the Newtonian gravity. So here, again, you have, so what you have? All massive particles experience Newtonian gravitational force, right? And here, what, sorry, in the, this mechanics, what you simply say is that time x double dot, and then force now you is say what? Oh, minus f. Great phi. And the phi is the gravitational potential. Hmm? And then you do something very strange. This L and this L, you cancel out. And then you come out with this uh, universal statement. That the gravitational acceleration is universal. The gravitational acceleration is independent of the mass of the particle. Gravity is the most democratic force which pulls everybody with the same acceleration, irrespective of their size, mass, 
any other. So if you have this. So then again, here again, you say, since if you want to make this universal, then I should be able to express as well. The expression of should be geometric. I should be able to write, write this a geometric statement. Now, when you say geometric statement, what is the line? We are relative to this man. We are relative to some space time, space we really you don't know, but there must exist some. Similarly, if this has to be universal, here also you might be shown that this law, the motion under gravity of particles. So the, uh, so, so let, let us call this thing. So let's again call it. You say space time relative to some domain. Or some some space, which is not this, neither this, something else, that would be. <laughs> but before going there, so let's do some, so are we completely happy with this? With all of them we have. Doesn't matter, but what what you generally write with this. So now in terms of this, you will say m x double goes that's minus g and m over r square. That's how you write. Now so let us try to get back understand. What does this M stand for? What do I understand? Physically, what does it mean? What it is job? What it's supposed to do? It exists. Huh? Yeah? It exists more. Uh, it, it, it resists more. Right. So, this job is to resist most. And so that is what we generally is a little more sophisticated term we use for this and this motion we call it with fingers, yes. <coughs> the object in any given state has an inertia, and if you want to change its state of motion, then this inertia is resistant, that change. What is the job of this? This is measure of what? <coughs> this is the measure of particles response to gravity. Right? So, for example, you have a this your uh, in the electricity case, what do you have? Mx double dot equal to two times grad phi, right? Q is the charge of the particle, then the mass. So, what is the Q? <coughs> Q here is that the charge which responds to the electric force, right? So here the M 
is a job. It's, it's a measure of the property of the particle that it is exposed to gravity. In the same way, the charge is electric charge is measure of the response of the particle to electric force. <clears throat> so first thing, and since here you use the same thing, why should be two? Two properties the same. Then the one versus two motion, irrespective of whether the force pulling force is gravity or any other. The other is a property in response to a specific force gravity. Why should these two properties be the same? The measure should be equal. So here, in the Newtonian mechanics, we have a, a conceptual problem like entertainment. However, in science, one thing happens that something we may not understand, but If it works, meaning assuming them to be equal, I do calculation and I make say that motion of the particle and the gravity, and if my observations agree with this, then I don't worry about this whether what this conceptual problem. So that is precisely the situation in gravity. That despite this, your very major conceptual problem, it worked. It agrees with the motion of planets, everything exactly <coughs> this. So, so, so that that's so. However, wherever there is such a conceptual problem, sometimes when you really go deeper and down, those problems will tell you that there is a problem. And then they ask you, like, we need to fix these problems. But in this problem, so that's one. Here, Again, you have this. This fellow job is what? This fellow job is that is source of characteristics. So when normal level, would you say? So this this represents the active gravitational mass. This represents the passive gravitational mass. Response to this. And this is the inertial mass. So, what the, the Newtonian theory, when it, that it works, it is based on this assumption that inertial mass is equal to the passive gravity. And why that is, all what we know is that experiments say that yes, this is correct, but I don't understand it. And there is no reason for them to be the same. So there is a, no explanation here. So that's another problem. <clears throat> so first question is what well, this, that you want the motion on the gravity to be universal, then it should be a geometric statement and we should see it's, it's, the geometry of some of the appropriate space. Okay. 
So that's fine. And then we have this problem. Now, wait. Before we go, let me also give you one, another way of getting at your zero mass particles. So what you have in the Newtonian theory, you have a particle as kinetic energy when it moves. And if it moves under some force, then yes, it has a potential. Right? But I say free, free space, no force. In the absence of no force, its energy is kinetic. But here, one thing, the particle as such, we have introduced externally. Where from the particle can that the Newtonian mechanics does not exist. Right? Now, if I assume in a simplistic way that nothing could be created without spending an energy. So if the particle to introduce, then some energy must have been spent in creating that. And that is the energy which this particle should always carry with it. Whether in motion or not in motion, because this is inherent to this. So if we write, so the total energy of the particle should actually be kinetic energy plus its rest energy. Energy which is at rest. Now you, so even this simple concept, they get you something else. Now you say particle is not doing kinetic energy, zero is entire energy at rest. But this I must say here is we are extending the Newtonian concept. The Newtonian concept. Newtonian mechanics does not have a concept of rest energy. Because this takes as a particle as human external. So we, if you want. To. But how about looking at this other way around? What happens when the rest energy is given? The particle's entire energy is entirely kinetic. And when we say again, so what, when I say rest energy is zero, rest energy is zero for all but relative to all of the words. So it's energy, so which is essentially saying it's entire energy, kinetic energy. So which is rest energy zero particle, it's not saying mass to say it is a zero mass particle. And again, we come to say the zero mass particle should be moving relative to all of the words, and hence it should be moving at a universal universal velocity. So this is another way of attracting to this. Okay, now let us try to ask the question that all through we have been saying. Here I need, need a new geometry to include this university. Here again I need a new geometry to make this an universal statement for the motion and the gravity is universal. So, so let's first try to see, and we know this cannot be the existing framework of a three space and one time. Because that, all the Newtonian framework is based on that. It's based on one. So we have to go beyond this. For going beyond that, let's see. So let's also ask one other question. Same from the Newtonian mechanics. How do we define free space?
<coughs> that is motion, free motion, minor motion of particle, free particle, and no force. So you must have had this thing that that means space is homogeneous in isotropic. <coughs> what does homogeneity mean? Particle position doesn't matter. Or isotropic means direction doesn't So, which essentially means the motion of the particle does not depend upon the space coordinates. That's why you get it. Right? Similar, secondly, time is homogeneous. So, like the position, space position does not matter. Similarly, time position also doesn't matter. And of course, it's a clear figure. Uh, uh, it, it is. Uh, Clearly visible from this thing, the Lagrangian of a free particle is independent of the space coordinates as well as time. It doesn't depend upon the space and time, right? Space homogeneity means I can freely interchange that's and what? Because Nothing depends on it, also does not depend on it. What I call X, I can have to call it Y and Y, Y, so so. But you have, you have, you have no, no problem with this. But, I say not only space is homogeneous, space and time both are homogeneous. Then I should be able to do the same thing now. It doesn't need to run time up. So whatever they call it, if I can talk to you, that's more useful. Are you happy with this? Can you do that? Why? Time is unidirectional. Huh? Time is unidirectional. There is something else. So yes, unidirectional is the one. But uh, something else. There is some... Uh, what is the difference between X and T? Dimensionally gaps. Right? So they are not on the same coding. One is length, one which you measure in centimeters, other is time which you measure in seconds. So it's like saying you, you cannot uh, interchange Gaussian constants. Right? So, but, but these properties are general properties. Space being homogeneous and time being homogeneous for free particle, it's a general property. If they are not in the, on the same footing, the dimensions don't match, make them match. To make them match, what should I do? What do I need? Yes. Huh? So, so space and time are related to the velocity, right? So you said this. So, so you need a velocity. But what can I say about this velocity? Should it be universal or should it not be universal? <laughs> Why? Huh? 
more uh, analytical thing. You want an X and P to be on the to have the same dimension related to all of them. It should be the same for all. Because for if you need only do for one, then that's it's at no need. And so that velocity should be universal. Such that the space and time are on the same footing should be a universal statement. So I need a thing, so and that I define the not by. So this is your. So we need, so this is how, so far we have made no reference to any fault or anything. We are simply analyzing or trying to understand the mechanics, the questions we raise from the Newtonian framework and try to see where does it lead to it. So it leads to so what does it say? There must exist a universal velocity in nature. And that we don't care whose velocity it is. This is for Experiment to determine. This is a simple, pristine logic which tells me that there must exist a universal velocity. And it is required by the simply the homogeneity of space and time. No other reference to it. <clears throat> so this is essentially the first. Universal constant. We will uh, we will uh, start specify that it is a bit later. Now, if I have a constant universal velocity with me, so now I have bound space and time together. So I no longer now live in a three space and one time. But I live now in a four dimensional space time. So we come from this three plus one to four space time. So time is not an external independent entity. In the time is like one of the coordinates, like three space coordinates, I, I want time coordinate. And so now my manifold is a four dimensional space. Right? And this all is dictated by the existence of this universal velocity. So now can you tell me, yes, now the question, and that, that should be, uh, it should not be very hard to guess. Now can you tell me, what should be the motion of a zero mass particle? It should be the straight line in that space. So zero mass particle is a straight line relative to the four dimensional space. Now the straight line, we have an association with the three space looking something. Huh? Now when I'm trying to conceive of space and time where one fellow is moving, so, it, so the general term which we will now use for a free motion is the geodesy. This is what the mathematician defined. This is it. So, straight line is a geodesic related to three space. Okay. Now, here, the motion and the uh, motion in the, the, here is described by the 
Zero DC twelve four dimensional twist time. Oh, of course, four dimensional flash twist time. No can we check? So we so we come from the Newtonian mechanics to the Einstein mechanics by simple this one realization. The no solar is there. <coughs> and, uh, and now here yeah, we talk about this is the motion of the geodesic. No, we don't have to specify whether the particle has mass zero or non-zero. All particles in space-time will move under the geodesic, the geodesic, the geodesic or four dimensional space-time. Of course, if the mass is zero, it will satisfy the additional relation. But the motion is driven by the this is at universal <clears throat> and here we, so moment you have this, uh, let, let, yeah, the, let me invite, also say one thing, yes, another very simple, simple uh, way to realize that the, <clears throat> there must, must exist the universal velocity. And that is, So let's try to consider, define the concept of universality. What do we mean by it? And there are two, two properties which characterize it. That something which is the same for all. And equally shared by all. This is what very simple common sense definition of universality. Now let's ask the question. What are the such universal entities we know of, which are same for all and equally same? So, what what is what you what you would you call something which you know is universal? Under this criteria, that it should be the same and equally shared by all. Speed of light. Yes? Speed of light. Huh? Like, like speed of light. Speed of light to water. Yes, that is universal. But this is a speed is a derived concept. Something more. Go, go back and think to say, what is speed made of? Position. Huh? Position. To, to define speed, what do you need? <coughs> you need distance, you need time. So distance you mean is space, time. So, can we not? So, so another way of uh, these are just guesswords. I mean, which you should, these are always intuitive to say. You want the speed to be constant, which is defined only in terms of space and time. So it should also be in a space by itself would be universal, and time by itself would be universal. Back to this, without going to the speed. You could have 
we would have certainly said this, <coughs> this with a little bit more thought. The experience is a thing which satisfies this thing. This is a same for all. Equally same, except with the provision of taller fellow occupies a little more space than the other or the rounder of the bridge. So, except that otherwise this. Equally same. Fortunately, yet, we have not been able to the boundary of <coughs> space. Of course, we do virtual boundaries. You have the airspace boundaries of the countries. That's a fun. And so education is time. Time is universal. Right? Since space and time are both universal, by universality, what does it provide? What does it mean? The whatever is true for space must be true for time. They are both universal. And again, it's a simple question. We know this. The distance between two points in space, right? Depends upon the path you take. Because we, we always are very alert when you are hiring an auto rickshaw that the fellow should go straight rather than being run round and round. So this statement is an everyday experience. The spatial distance is path dependent. But now I said space and time are on the same footing. Whatever is true for space must also be true for time. So good. That, that, that means <coughs> that time interval between the two events should depend upon the path the clock takes from one event to the other. Moment you say, then you get shocked. What happened? This doesn't happen. I have a clock at home, I, one I carry with me. I come here to certain and then go back. The two clocks read the same. But if about this crazy logic is right, then they must not. Time must also be a path dependent quantity like space. So, so that's rather much and then the thing from this comes that the two quantities both are universal can they be independent you said when you want to say the two things are independent right what do you mean? you have to identify a property which is true for the one, not true for the other. But the moment you identify the property, that will break the universality. Right? So now you want to... So that, that means no two universal quantities could be independent. So they must be related. And that relation must also be universal. Since space and time are both universal, then they must be related. And that relation should be universal. And what relates the space, space and time is the velocity. And hence the velocity must be universal. So, the other again, getting into the system. Okay, so that's, so this is, so now the next question remains about how to, how do we make this a geometric statement for that. Hmm? Sir, I have a question. Yeah, yes. So, purely from an observational point of view, I can... Yeah, Joseph, well, yeah. Purely from an observational point of view, oh. I can conceive of space as homogeneous and isotope. Yeah. So, from an observational point of view, how can I conceive time as homogeneous? If 
at all I do. Why? So, so do an observation to tell me that uh, which tells you that time is not homogeneous. Which observation tell you that time is not homogeneous? अरे time तो आपने so, so no, so the point when, when you want to say is that when you say space is homogeneous, what you say, whatever phenomena you are observing, that phenomena does not depend upon the location of space. Similarly, the phenomena which you are observing should not depend upon the location in time. And all observations you do involve both space and time. So when you are seeing my observation I am doing, these all observations you are doing under the assumption that time is common. That your phenomena does not depend on. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, the question about uh, what's your next lecture, right? Right? Then you go to library on the this is lunch time, is it? Oh, then I can take a little liberty. How is the modality of time compatible with the universal? Pardon? How is homogeneity of time compatible with the universal? No, homogeneity of time, homogeneity of space and time demands universal force. How is homogeneity of time oh. compatible with the universal force? So, so I'm say, saying is almost. The universality of uh, velocity demands the homogeneity of both space and time. So that time. So I have a, so we came from this, that now we have come down to four dimensional space time, right? And we have, again, let's try to think we are talking about that. So now we are talking about the free space time. So the space time, uh, <laughs> so here, uh, so that means that this is the space time, which is this space time is homogeneous, which we, which we includes both these properties that space is homogeneous and isotropic and time is homogeneous. Now the next question you ask is okay, I was this space time, for space time which is homogeneous. What should be its geometry? We do not assume anything, do not introduce anything by hand, but we decide to ask that what should be its geometry? Another question to the question is since the space time is homogeneous, so must be a geometry. That is, it does not de depend upon where you want to observe which curvature of it. So just the geometry must be homogeneous. So that should be the same. Yeah. 
Geometry is characterized by what? Geometry is characterized by the curvature. And that curvature is what we Riemann curvature. You must have come across this creature. So, so it means that Riemann curvature must be homogeneous. Or, which means now we are talking about space time is not flat but curved. In for the curved space, something to be homogeneous <coughs> means homogeneity should be constant. A constant relative to what? Not the ordinary derivative. The ordinary derivative determines the constancy of things in the flat space. In the curved space, the relevant derivative is the omitted derivative. So space time, so the, that means the Riemann curvature <coughs> should be covariantly constant. So it's Which means I should be able to write this given tensor in terms of something which is what? Which is constant relative to covariant element. So you do you know any object? Which is constant relative to point element. You all know. If you have done this, you come up to this demand curvature you feel happy about, then you must also be knowing this. So what is what is it that's constant relative to point element? Let's go by this. The derivative means it should always define something which is constant relative to that. Of course, it's the ordinary derivative means then it constant is constant. So haven't you heard of something called the metric tensor? What is the coordinate of the metric tensor? No constant. Zero. So you have. So you, you have. This is how the coordinate of is defined. That is derivative is zero. You define a derivative such thing that it keeps the metric constant. So which means I should be able to write this demand curvature in terms of the metric. And so I write the answer. So that I have to respect the symmetry property of any one. It is symmetry between first two and the last two and the block and post symmetric. And I have to write that in terms of series. So which tells you that this has to be in this Demand curvatures involve the second derivative for the metric. Metric is dimensionless. 
Second derivative means on the left hand side I have the dimension L first. No, one over else. So here also I should have one over. But this is dimensionless. So I have to add a constant lambda with the condition that this has the one over length square. This dimension is one over length square. And this is all what we were characterizing free space time. Space time in absence of both forces. Right? And that turns out to be that it's a space time of constant curvature lambda. Lambda could be positive, negative, or zero without no. That is, here you have it. This is the space time of constant curvature. So, Curvature lambda, this will be positive and we call out zero. That this is actually for the experimental <coughs> So this lambda is the another universal constant group. So we got a C, first the universal constant which bounds space and time together. Lambda is characterizing the free space time with a constant curvature. So the C and lambda, so lambda defines a length. So C and lambda are the two. Constants of <coughs> space time structure. That we cannot talk about of the space time without seeing them. And these are the two most fundamental constants. Because no other constant has been integrated into the structure of space time. These are the two most fundamental constants. So first question is that the free space time, but this DC and Lambda is the most fundamental because this is all that we have done is this is without reference to any force. We are not interested in it. It's a free space, it's a property of the space time itself. <coughs> so the so, so this so this is a it's, uh, as it is, so, no, uh, so now the, the, the thing that you want to realize <clears throat> is the free space time is not flat, not of zero curvature, but in general, this was of a constant curvature, which could be zero or non zero, or if you are negative. <clears throat> so all of us. Textbook have a one, so almost, you know, I think all, all of them. Uh, atrocious in the wrong state. What do you do? What do you have? So you're, you say, when gravity is absent, human curvature is zero, and space time is flat. Right? That's, that's the whereas here what we say and we have followed our 
We are very provocative. We follow simply what well, we understood the space time is homogeneity in concept, adding that classical mechanism, the free space time added to a defined in classical mechanism. Space being homogeneous and isotropy, time being homogeneous. And that led us to the free space time geometry, space time of constant curvature, not necessarily of zero curvature. And this space time of constant curvature is maximally symmetric. Now, in your textbook view, you have one paradoxical statement space time of constant curvature, which they say is maximally symmetric. Though so it's maximally symmetric, but it has dynamics because you have associated dynamics with the curvature of this time. So you want to say, so it is essentially saying that crucially when you need to say this space is homogeneous, but yet force why is non-trivial. That it is represents represents some force. How can you hold it? We have a lot of similar situation you have. Space time is homogeneous. Yet how is it dynamically non-trivial in your view? Because in your statement is dynamic is attached to the different You want to come to it being zero or non zero. Here, yeah, the actually the correct thing is that the, the free space time, free of all dynamics, can have a constant curvature and space. Now we come, we come to the gravity and the arc distribution. What happens when the space time is known? And of course, immediately say. The inhomogeneity means presence of force. Presence of force means what is what determines is dynamics. Again, we will say we don't put anything from outside by hand. We will have the same question geometry give us the dynamics of the force, which is responsible for this. That's what we do.